The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace, that we may be ready to receive you wherever you appear. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Genesis. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir, but one who is your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river, the river Euphrates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read responsibly from Psalm 33. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. Happy the people chosen to be God's heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees all humankind. God sits firmly enthroned and watches all who dwell on the earth. God fashions all their hearts and observes all their deeds. A king is not saved by the size of the army, nor are warriors rescued by their great strength. The horse gives vain hope for victory. Despite its great strength, it cannot save. Truly your eye is upon those who fear you, O Lord, upon those who wait for your steadfast love. Deliver their lives from death, and to keep them alive in time of famine. Our innermost being waits for you, O Lord, our helper and our shield. Surely our hearts rejoice in you, for in your holy name we put our trust. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us, even as we place our hope in you. A reading from Hebrews. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, and he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises. 
But from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Do not be afraid, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Have you ever been promised something and had to wait a long time to see that promise fulfilled? Maybe it was the promise of a honeymoon you couldn't afford right away, so you promised each other you'd go on one in the future. Maybe it was the promise of a remodel or to finish part of the house that get, didn't get done for years. We often joke with my boss at work that it took her husband about 15 years to finally grout the floor of the bathroom. Maybe it was the promise of a pay raise, a promotion, leadership on a project, a big contract, or any of the other things that go with our personal lives. Promises have been made to us. We've put our hopes and our expectations in those promises, and we've watched years go by without a word. And we've been on both sides of those promises, haven't we? We've had promises made to us, and we've made promises to others that for a whole variety of reasons, see time pass before the promise is kept. And truly sometimes, because we're human, some of those promises never get fulfilled. I completed seminary in the spring of 2010. Like four and a half years of undergraduate study, another four years of seminary, had excelled in seminary classes, finished coursework near the top of my class, high recommendations from faculty. And as we prepared to transition from seminary to ordained ministry, we were regularly, every day, told about the great pastor shortage and the need for pastors all over this country. We were told the church needed us. It needed us. We're told that if you, we worked hard and studied hard and jumped through all the hoops that they put before us, it would only be a few short weeks before we'd be serving a congregation. October 2015, five and a half years later, that's when I was ordained. Over five years and a doctorate degree later is when I finally knelt before a bishop and had the clergy of the synod put their hands on me, had a red stole placed around my neck and began service in our church as an ordained pastor. I felt like I had fulfilled my end of the deal. I'd done everything I was supposed to do. And what did I get for it? Five and a half years. Well, I got you. Right. But five and a half years of anger, of confusion, of sadness, and a belief, a belief that the promises that I had left seminary with were never going to be fulfilled. That's the place where we meet Abram in today's text from Genesis. Here is a man who has spoken to God. 
Here is a man whom God chose out of all of the people of this world to bless. Here is a man who has been given a promise of a son and a great nation with descendants too many to count. All he has to do is what God asks of him. And he did. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. And yet here he remains without an heir. So after years of waiting, years of seeing this promise go unfulfilled, years of trying to have a child with only disappointment and sadness for he and Sarai, Abram is getting frustrated. And his patience is probably running a little thin. It's hard to blame him. We first meet Abram at the end of chapter 11 in Genesis. And it's at the start of chapter 12 that Abram is first given that promise of a great nation that will come from him. A lot has happened in three chapters to get to today's text, and a lot of time has passed. So for this text to make sense, we look back at the context of what's been happening up to Genesis in in this point. And I know I talk about this a lot, but I'm convinced that without a firm, solid foundation of an understanding of the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you really can't understand the rest of the Bible. Okay, so Genesis 1, seven-day creation story. God takes chaos and disorder and creates form and structure. First, God creates spaces, light and dark, sea and sky, or waters above, waters below, and then land and sea. And then God fills those spaces in days 4, 5, and 6 with Life, sun, moon, and stars, birds and fish, land animals, and water animals. And the height of God's work in bringing order out of chaos in this wasteland is the creation of human beings. God creates male and female together and calls them the image of God. And they're to be fruitful and multiply and fill this earth. They're to be co-rulers with God in creation, tending to the animals in the land. And they're invited to partner with God on a seventh day of rest that has no end. Genesis 2 starts with this image of an unworked farm field. And God creates human beings to, or a human being to work the ground. And God plants a garden in the east and places this human in the garden to tend to it and care for the trees and the plants. But God sees that this human being needs a partner, so all the animals of the land and the sky are created and brought before the human, and he gives each of them a name, but a partner isn't found. So God puts a human in a deep sleep and takes a rib and forms a partner for the human, giving us male and female. And these two, like chapter 1, are to be co-rulers with God over creation. In both stories, humans eat from the fruit trees, the animals eat from the plants of the ground, and no human or no animal sustains its life by taking the life of another. All life lives in perfect harmony with each other, with humans sharing in responsibility for ensuring God's blessing for life is extended to all living things. That's the creation God intended. Humans living in this world partners with God in caring for and ruling over creation. But things go horribly wrong. Now most people think of the fall as what happens in chapter 3 with a talking snake in a garden. But the fall of creation is really what happens from chapter 3 to chapter 11 of Genesis, where we're finally introduced to Abram. So very quickly, I promise, quickly, this is the story of the fall. Humans tempted by a snake seize power for themselves rather than trust in God. They eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and are pushed out of the garden. And the first thing that happens outside of the garden is Cain's jealousy burns against his brother. He kills him, introducing violence and death into creation. Cain leaves his family and he builds a city. Six generations later, Lamech, we're told, revels in killing. He twists God's promise to Cain and sees it as license for murder. Generations continue to fall in violence and death, great wickedness and evil about So God chooses Noah and through him presses a restart button on creation with a flood. Only Noah, his family, and two of every kind of animal are spared this decreation of the flood. And they eventually come off this ark and they're given the very same original blessing of Eden to Adam and Eve. 
be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God recommissions humans to be co-rulers over land and animals. It's a new Eden, a new start to this world. And Noah plants a vineyard, a garden in this new Eden. He grows grapes. And like we might expect, he makes wine, he gets drunk, he falls asleep in his tent, and something happens which is kind of unclear, but once again, creation spirals into the fall. Generations pass and human beings again fill the earth. So chapter 11 starts with human beings gathered together, making all these advances in technology, particularly the technology to build structures. And they want to use this technology to build a tower that stretches up to the sky, reaching once again, like with the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to grasp at the power of the heavens. And God comes down and sees these, that for these humans, nothing's going to be impossible when they set their mind to it. And so he confuses their languages and scatters them across the earth. And that city, that Babel, is a city that will become known as Babylon. So God devises a new plan for redeeming creation. Rather than wipe everyone out and start over again, God is going to choose a single human being and his family and his descendants and through them bless all of creation. It's through this one human and his offspring that God's going to bless and redeem this creation. And that man is Abram. Do you see how we get to Abram? A perfect creation with humans as co-rulers with God. Temptation and desire enter this creation, resulting in a spiraling down of violence and death and the corruption of humankind. God uses a flood to start over with the cycle of sin only continuing to spin out of control. And so one man, one family, one lineage will be chosen by God to restore humans blessing back to all of creation. Which brings us back to promises and waiting. God elects Abram and promises that a great nation is going to come from him, and through him, all the nations of the earth are going to receive God's blessing. But Abram's wife is barren and childless. Even so, Abram trusts God. He trusts God's promise, and he does as God asks him. He leaves his home, he leaves his people, he leaves his land, and he settles far away in the land of Canaan. Time passes, and a famine begins. Still no children. Abram and Sarai go down to Egypt, where Abram becomes very wealthy. More time passes. Still no children. They return from Egypt after the famine, and they settle with their great wealth in the land that God tells them to. Still no children. Abram does what he's supposed to. His wealth keeps growing. Still no children. Abram's nephew, Lot, also rich, separates from them. He ends up getting captured in the middle of a war, and he's finally rescued by Abram. Still no children. Time marches on. Days stretch into weeks, stretch into years, and still Abram and Sarai are without children. It's been, by the time we get to chapter 15, almost two decades since Abram first heard the voice of God and left the land of his ancestors, trusting in this promise that was given to him. And yet, no children. In today's text, God finally breaks the silence. God says, Abram, you're going to have a great reward. But after all this time, after everything that has happened, after doing everything God has asked of him, and more... He remains childless. So instead of rejoicing when he hears the word of God, he laments. He hears great reward and he says, I don't need more stuff. I'm wealthy already. I have gold and livestock and land. He wants a son. He wants descendants to inherit what he's built. Without that, some servant born in his house is going to inherit what he has. He wants God to be faithful to the promise that God made all those years ago. Now, this is something new I learned just this last week. I never heard this before. So whenever a text says, so-and-so said ABC, and so-and-so said XYZ, it means there's two separate conversations, right? Otherwise, why reinsert Abram said? So in Abram's conversation with God, 
It's not one lament to God, it's two. Which means time passes between them. Which means, among other things, that the first time Abram laments and says, Eliezer, a son of Damascus, is going to be my heir, God is silent. We don't know why. We're not given any clues, but we can certainly appreciate Abram's frustration in coming back to God and insisting that God is failing to live up to God's end of this deal if the servant is going to inherit his wealth. And rather than rebuke him or correct him, God doubles down on his promise to Abram. No, God says, not the servant, not Eliezer, not someone else is going to be your heir. A biological son born to you will be your heir, and your descendants will be as numerous as the stars of the sky. And Abram believes God. But even so, Abram's not yet quite satisfied. He's heard this promise before, right? Any of us would feel the same way. We've been promised things and promised them again and promised them again without ever having them fulfilled. Abram wants a sign. He wants proof. He wants more than just words. So God gives him the instructions. Bring me a cow, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Well, Abram goes and he gets these animals, and then something kind of strange happens in our text. Without any further instructions from God on what to do with these animals, Abram takes the cow and he cuts it in half. And he takes the goat and he cuts it in half. And he takes the ram and he cuts it in half. I like how the text just says this, like that's no big deal, like it wouldn't be hard to cut a cow in half. And then, and then he takes the two birds and he slaughters them open and he takes the halves and the two birds and he puts them in a parallel line with each other. So it kind of sounds kind of odd, right? God didn't tell him to do this. What's Abram doing? Well, it turns out that as soon as Abram heard that God, what God was asking him to do, Abram knew exactly what was going on. God was about to make a covenant with Abram in a practice well known in Abram's time. So imagine this scenario with me. A new, powerful military comes to an area and takes over the land. And this new ruler calls you and me, all the landowners, and tells us that if we follow him and obey his laws and pay him a tribute from our land, he'll offer in exchange safety and protection. Or how about this? A young man wants to marry a young woman. So the young man and his family go to the young woman's father and they settle on the terms of the marriage. The young man's family is going to pay an agreed upon dowry in exchange. The young woman will be given in marriage to the young man. In either of these scenarios, to cement the new arrangement, you have to walk the blood path. A cow, a goat, and a ram are slaughtered and they're cut in half. And at a place where there's kind of a natural low-lying area, the halves are to be placed on either side so that the blood runs down into that low-lying area. And then you slaughter the two birds and you put them on the area so that their blood runs down into this low-lying area. The two poor people who are entering into the arrangement put on white robes. Now the lesser of the two parties goes first. So in the examples, right, it would be the landowner or the young man who wants to marry the young woman. And they walk between the halves, stomping their feet in the blood so that this blood that is pooled into the ground splashes up on their robes. And then after that, the greater of the parties does the same. In essence, what they're saying is this. If I don't keep up my end of the deal, may I end up like these animals and my blood poured out before you. It's intense. So back to Abram. Abram has laid out the animals in exactly the way it's supposed to be done for the ritual of making a covenant. What's the next step in the ritual? The lesser party is supposed to walk through, right? Between God and Abram, who do you think's the lesser party? Abram. Abram is supposed to walk through the center of those animals. But he doesn't. He can't. Because Abram knows the truth. He can't possibly uphold his end of the covenant without making a mistake or going astray at some point. The second his foot touches the blood in that path, Abram knows he's signing his own death. 
This is a guy who lied about his wife to Pharaoh so that he could become wealthy. He's killed people in battle. He has strayed at times from the instructions God gave him by going to Egypt in the first place. When it comes to making a covenant with God, when our part in the covenant is to do what God tells us to do, we're going to fall short. We're going to get it wrong. That's the whole point of Genesis 3 to 11. So Abram waits. Now, how many of you have harvested a, a wild animal hunting or slaughtered a farm animal? Probably most of us, right? And I've harvested many white-tailed deer in my years of hunting. And because of the time of day when we harvest them, there have been times when I've had to field dress that deer on my own. And then it sat there right in the woods for a few hours while I, we wait until the time when we're all going to come out of the woods and we drag the deer out. And you know what I've never had to do in hours, hours of sitting there with an animal that I've harvested and field dressed? Shoo away scavengers. For scavengers to find the scent and start coming to eat the freshly killed animal can take hours. It can take days, depending on where you're at. So the fact that Abram has to sit there and drive away birds of prey that come down on these animals means that he is just sitting there for a long time, not sure what to do. He's afraid to go through himself. And he's not sure what's going to happen next. But we can imagine that Abram is certain. He has waded in far over his head. And that's when the incredible happens. God puts Abram into a deep, unsettling sleep. In fact, it's the exact same words, the exact same words for the deep sleep that God puts Adam into in chapter 2 before taking his rib and giving him a partner. And then God, in the form of smoke and fire, walks the blood path. Think about what that means for a moment. God is saying to Abram, if I, God, fail to live up to my end of the covenant, to give you a son and descendants and through you bless this world, I put my very life on the line. And God is also saying to Abraham, Abram, if you, Abram, fail to live up to your end of the covenant, following my commands and my laws and my instructions, I, God, will take the consequences of that too. Where you fail, where you fall short, where you can get lost and fall away from the covenant we're forming together, God will take full responsibility and see that the terms of that covenant hold fast. This is unlike anything that has ever been done before. God is so committed to Abram and the covenant of blessing that God is willing to put God's own life on the line for its sake. God so desires that the blessing of Eden might once again be lived and experienced by all living creatures that God is willing to risk God's own life for it. God loves this world so much. God loves you so much that God is willing to die for you. And it doesn't matter how many times you fall away. And it doesn't matter how little you might sometimes believe. And it doesn't matter how often you struggle with faith. And it doesn't matter how much you question. It doesn't matter how angry you get with God. It doesn't matter that you cry out to God and the suffering in your life. It doesn't matter that you hold God accountable to the promises God has made. God loves you so much that God is willing to risk everything for you. And yeah, God wants you to live in faithfulness to God's law as a response of outpouring love for God in this world. God does want you to seek to follow God's commands and instructions for living in relationship with each other. God wants you to seek equity and justice on behalf of the marginalized. God wants you to welcome the outcast and the stranger. God wants you to care for those who cannot care for themselves. God wants you to love your neighbor as yourself. But even when you don't, even when it just seems like too much to handle right now, what, that the weight of God's law is too burdensome to carry, God won't abandon you. God will never leave you. God will always, always be faithful to God's promises to you and me. Humanity will fail. 
Abram will lose trust in God and take matters into his own hands in the very next chapter with his wife's servant Hagar. God's people will read in the rest of the Old Testament and into the New will fall away from God over and over and over. And you and I will <coughs> fail to be the blessing that God desires us to be as sons and daughters of Abraham. And just as is promised in chapter 15, God will do the incredible, the unthinkable, the fullest expression of God's love for you and for me in this whole creation. God will die on a cross so that you and I might have life. Because God does not go back on God's promises ever. And Eden will be restored. Thanks be to God. Amen.